so hi everybody. Um, so my name is Glenn. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, coming tonight uh, to listen to this thing, obscure thing named GraphQL. Um, so uh, I am a software engineer, like most of you guys. Um, I work as a freelancer right now. Uh, um, I do mobile uh, most of the time, mostly, and uh, also a great deal of backend, um, uh, especially Node.js. Uh, and I enjoy uh, building stuff with various technologies, uh, hence GraphQL. Uh, so uh, the thing is, when I started uh, writing this talk um, a few months ago, I wasn't a freelancer yet. Uh, I was uh, a CTO in a small startup. Uh, and we're building a very simple service. So the idea was that you had uh, a mobile. We had a mobile client, a mobile phone. So uh, we had a na native um, mobile client uh, on which you could uh, order uh, food. Um, and so that you, could, you would go to a restaurant and grab uh, your food later on. So, we had uh, uh, a mobile client on iOS and Android. We had uh, another client, an iPad client, in the kitchen, so that when the order would come through our partners, they would uh, validate or not your order, uh, depending on if they, ha they, they had uh, enough food or not. Uh, and um, in between, between the kitchen and you, the, the user, we had a service. So. The service was basically a server, uh, as you can guess. And it was a, co a collection of service. So everything was built uh, independently so that uh, if we wanted to move one of the service into a microservice, for example, it would be very easy. Uh, so we had a service for authentication, of course, users, orders, places, menu, uh, many other services. Uh, and all those services were built uh, using different technologies, not all of the same. We had Node.js, we had Go, uh, we had the menus in the Mongo database, we had the places in the PostgreSQL database, we had some real-time transport with WebSocket so that the order could come to the iPad in real time in the kitchen. Uh, but none of those technologies would matter to the client, of course. Uh, when you're building your app, uh, you don't really care about Node.js or Mongo. What you care about is your server. And that's why we build API. Uh, we build uh, a door, we provide a door so that people who want to use our service, want to use our server, whether they are people in the company or a third party developer, have access to uh, our backend. Um, as of today, 99% of the time, when we think about API, we think about REST. Uh, when we think about building a server, building an API, we think about building something over REST. I'm here to talk about something different, and GraphQL sits at the same place. It is um, another way to think about uh, APIs, and it's another way to build API. It's a different uh, uh, paradigm. It's a different way to serve information over a network. So before diving into GraphQL, uh, Let's address the elephant in the room. So what is wrong with REST? Honestly, in my opinion, there is absolutely nothing wrong with REST at all. Um, REST has limitation. It is aging. It is an old standard. It's not really a standard, actually. It's a set of ideas. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an old collection of ideas. Um, it has 20 years. And, um, there are a few limitations that you can bump into very easily, uh, even as of today, uh, when you're building uh, a service. So let's lay the ground for basic concept on which we can all agree. So REST, one of the core of REST is resource, right? So you access information on the server through a resource, and you address those resource through a URL scheme. So if I want a collection of resources, for example, I can hit a simple route. If I want to access one particular resource, I can access it using its ID. If I want a nested resource, I can do it uh, using this URL scheme, and so on. So let's try and be more concrete. Uh, let's say we're a startup and we're building a 
collaborative blogging uh, service. So we have a resource named Post. So we can access a collection of posts, we can access one particular post, or we can access the comments of this post, and the, or the contributor, all right. Uh, and that, so that's for one part. On the other part, we have uh, a, a set of operations that we can perform uh, on those routes. So we have, um, we can create information, we can read information, we can update, and we can delete. That's what we all know as CRUD, right? When we think about CRUD, most of the time, when we think about REST, we think about REST over HTTP. So we translate all those uh, things into um, HTTP verbs, pose, get, put, and delete. So patch is not here. Uh, it's kind of the forgotten child um, of HTTP. Uh, but the, that's the idea. You have, a, you have roots and you have verbs, and you apply uh, depending on the root and depending on the verb, you're gonna perform a different, uh, different uh, operation. So let's say we start building our API, right? Um, we want a list of posts, so we're gonna hit this route, right? We can add a few parameters to our URL, so we want to limit the number of posts we're gonna receive to 25, and uh, we're gonna specify a type. We want the training post. So this is the JSON we will receive, right? Uh, we have a key data uh, with a title, uh, which uh, with the, that is a list of uh, posts. And for each post, we have a specific um, number of set of arguments of par oh, sorry of keys. So we have title, content, description, picture, author, name, avatar. So that's not new. Um, and if you want one particular post, well, it's almost the same response for one post. It's just that it's a, it's an object. It's not a list. Okay, cool. So. We start implementing it, and this is how it looks like. Um, it's a classic list uh, of objects. We have a picture, we have the title, and we have the name of the author, right? So <clears throat> here, we bump into one of the problems um, of RESTful APIs, is that one endpoint means one resource, okay? Uh, and you actually receive the, whole, the entire resource. And here, there are a few fields that we're not using. We are not using the content, nor the description, nor the avatar. So for avatar and description, it's not a big deal. But for content, it is a big deal. Because for this article here, true fact, the content, the size of this string, it's just a huge string that contains the entire article, like the person that somebody is going to read. It contains, uh, it, it accounts for more than 99% of the size of this object. It's a huge string, a very huge string. So we have to receive 25 objects, and on those 25 objects, we receive 90% more information than we should. Uh, at scale, it's awful, because you're serving information, you're serving information that your client is not using over the network. Just sending, sending content, just some batch of content, and they're not using it at all. Uh, Things to take into account is that, all right, today we all have 4Gs and everything. But when you want to build a service today, we think about areas where people don't have a, a good connectivity, or you also have to think about the fact that you pay for uh, data that, comes, that goes out of your server. So just think at scale with a million requests every day. You have a million requests with 90 more percent information that it needs, right? So this is a very aggressive way to return a list of posts. So, we won't keep those information, right? We just decide to remove them from our API. We just decide to remove them from the service on this route, this specific route. Uh, so we're happy. Uh, we just push that into production, and uh, we go and grab some drinks. But there is a, another problem. Uh, here, we need to take into account that if we do that, we break our API. We need to, when you build an API, you want to be future-proof, right? You want your API uh, to evolve. And uh, you want to have different versions of your API. You're going to modify stuff over, over the time, right? So that's why we have versioning. There's a huge debate in the community about how to do versioning right or wrong. And uh, I don't want to spark any debate. Uh, most of the APIs you know works like this. You just modify part of the root, and you put the version into the root, right? So let's say we do that. We say we have an API v1 that works like this. And we have another one, uh, a v2, an evolution of our API, with a different set of fields. 
uh, so that if people were use, are using, want to use or were using the API v1, well, well it, it will still work. Well, uh, well, if people want to move to the new API, they just have to uh, hit this route, the API v2. All right, that's cool. Now we move, uh, we start with keep building, and now there is a new requirement. We want to display comments in our post, right? Every post has a comment, or at least a list. So we want to display the number of comments uh, for uh, every post in our list. But we need to think carefully here. Uh, we can't just go and uh, take bold decisions. Comments is a key still uh, on our object. And common is an array, but it's an array of objects. It's an array of objects with a content, an author, a name, and a picture, right? Um, we can't just do like we did earlier. We can't just remove the fields we don't want, because here we actually want to display those fields. And we need to take into account a few things. We have two different displays. We have a mobile app, and we have a desktop app. On the mobile app, we want to display the number of comments. But on the desktop app, we want to display the number of comments and the first three comments. How do we do here? Well, what's, the, what's the compromise? Uh, we, need, we need to find something, because we don't want to build custom endpoints. Uh, I don't want my API to be mobile and desktop. I don't want to build to do that. It's not restful. That's what some people would say, right? So we don't want to dive into that. We need to think about it carefully. Returning relationship, nested relationship is very aggressive, and uh, that's not how REST states that things should be. Uh, one root means one resource. So if you have relationships, well, you use your IDs. So you have an array of IDs. That's classic. That's most APIs we use works like that. You have an array of, uh, of uh, whether you don't have an array of object of comments, you have an array of IDs, right. Or you can have an object, uh, an array of, uh, root slash IDs. That's also something that works. Let's say we go with the first one, okay? So here, we have a compromise. We can, on the mobile phone, just compute the size of the array, and on the desktop, we can do more, uh, we can um, do the, the, the request we need to fetch uh, the comments we don't have. All right, perfect. So, those two, those two, there, there's a thing. Uh, there's, there, there are two terms here that we need to uh, 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 talk about. It's called overfetching and underfetching. The mobile is overfetching. It's receiving more information than it needs. The desktop in this configuration right now is underfetching because it's receiving a list of IDs, but it actually needs an object, right? So it needs to do a run trip. It needs to receive its list and go into the every post and fetch every comment for every post. So it's doing run trips. So that's the reality of REST. That's how it works. That's how it should be implemented. That's RESTful. That's how it should work, right? So we can even make things more complex, all right, right? We can say now we have collaborators and, you know, collaborators, same thing. It's a list of collaborators with a name and a picture. And the thing is, on mobile, we don't display them, but on desktop, we do. So same thing, overfetching on mobile, desktop is fine. Uh, we can even add more complexity to this. We can say we have now two uh, different set of articles. We have the network one uh, the, and the, the trending one, uh, which are two lists. And we don't display them on mobile. So you get the thing. It, it, it can become very, very cumbersome. But that is restful. And you know, there are many ways to solve this. And some people will build custom endpoints and like, do other things like that. But it's part conversation. You know, like, it's not restful or things like that. You know? Um, I don't want to spark the debate of what's restful or not tonight. Uh, we can talk about it later. Uh, but the fact that this debate exists, uh, for me, is a symptom of a problem. As I said, REST is not a specification. It's not a standard. It's a collection of ideas. And you have a latitude. You can do, uh, you have freedom to do a few things. Uh, it's a, you have a gray area where you can actually perform, right? So enough of REST. Uh, let's dive into GraphQL now, see how we can address those issues. So first thing first, GraphQL was created by Facebook in, 2000, in 2012. Uh, so, so anybody who has a Facebook app uh, on its phone uh, uh, at the moment, your phone has been, ma has been um, making uh, GraphQL queries since 2012. Um, they released a first open source drive two years ago in 2015. 
So it's pretty new. Um, GraphQL stands for Graph Query Language. It is a data query language for your API. As I said, it's a, it's a mean of transport. It's a way to ask information to a server and to receive it. It is platform, protocol, and language agnostic. You can do GraphQL with any language over any network and over any protocol. You can do it in HTTP, WebSocket, IMQP, FTT, FTP. You can even ask for bytes for torrents with GraphQL. You can ask for everything. You can even go to the restaurant and order your food with GraphQL if you want. It works. So as any language needs to be talked by every parties, the client needs to, be, to, needs to talk a GraphQL, and your server needs to speak GraphQL, both of them. So let's see how it works. Let's try it, all right? So I have a server on my computer. So just a quick, uh, quick, um, quick question. Um, who does uh, Node.js? Okay, cool. Uh, uh, who does PHP? All right. Who does Ruby? Okay. All right. Um, who has never seen JS ever? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so my server is in, J in JavaScript. Uh, it's running over Node.js. Here it is. Um, just, yeah, it's the right one. All right. So. Maybe I can do this. All right. So <clears throat> what you see here is called GraphQL. So I have a server that is running. And on my server, I have a GraphQL API running. And um, every implementation of GraphQL comes with this thing called GraphQL. You see here I'm hitting my localhost 8080. Uh, it's a lightweight client. Uh, it's something uh, in your, uh, on, on your server which, on which that you can use to uh, perform a few uh, queries. So yeah, you can test queries uh, on, uh, on your in your browser. In your browser. So let's let's go. So there are two type of uh, operation in GraphQL. There is there is the query and the mutation type. So the query, as you can guess, is the type of operation you use when you want to ask for something, right? So a GraphQL query starts with the keyword query, OK? Uh, and you open brackets. If you don't put brackets, um, it will, uh, by default, it is a query. Um, but we'll keep it. So let's say. So we have a query, all right? And inside of those brackets, you're going to uh, write the name of your queries. So there are, uh, rem just remember that in GraphQL, you don't have roots. You just, just have one endpoint. It's the slash GraphQL. That's it. And on this endpoint, you send your strings. You send your queries. And that's it. All right? So we have a few queries that exist on our server. I have two queries here, post and post by ID. Right? And it's telling me, well, the post return a list of posts based on their type. And post by ID return one post based on its ID. So let's say I want uh, a list of posts. All right? So I just write the name of my query. Then I open all the, uh, a new set of brackets. And, um, and that's where things get interesting. So here, I'm going to say which field I want on every post. So if I only want the title, for example, I hit title. And I, if I hit my query, I receive my objects. So I have a data key with a key post, which is an array of posts with the title. If I, want, um, if I want the ID of every post, well, I just hit ID. And we get the ID. So remember, we also add a picture URL. So I hit it and have a picture URL, all right? Uh, you remember we had the, an author, right? Well, if I want the author, I just ask for the author. And I open a new set of brackets. And I say this, the field that I want on my author. So if I just want the name of the author, I just type name. And I run it. And I would just get this slim object here with only the fields I asked for. So that's basically GraphQL in a nutshell. That's, that's the basics of it. You, Ask for information, and you receive exactly what you ask for. You're never overfetching. You're never underfetching. You're only receiving what you ask for, only receiving what you need. Um, so you remember we also had a, so here it is, the thing, the, co the content field. Let's run it. All right. That's a terrible content. 
So I wasn't lying, it's a huge thing, it's a huge object, right? We don't need it. Uh, there are also comments, you remember? So here we had a field comment. Well, um, if I want, let's say, the author of the comment, I open the new bracket and I say I just want the name of the author and I run my query and here it is. I have a few comments and if I want the content here, I run this and here the thing goes crap, I run and check, I like this guy. So, um, so that's, the, that's the basics of it. Um, in GraphQL, every field, every single field is a function. So every single field can or not have parameters. So the ID field is just, it's a field uh, with no parameters. The picture, the title also. Picture URL uh, can have parameters. I can say, I want a picture with a size of two, 200 by 200. And I just run it, and the server will just perform the request to send me the, 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 the picture I want. Um, so same for comments. Here, I have a field limit, and I can limit the number of comments I want. So let's say I just want the first three ones. I'll run it, and uh, I, would, I would just have a, it, it will, the, the server will actually resolve my query, right? So um, when I say every single field is a query, there are th two things to, to take into account. GraphQL is strongly typed. Every field has a type. So if I put my, uh, my, um, my mouse here, you see that the ID field, all right, has a type int. Same for title, it has a type string. Picture URL has a type string too. Author has a type name user. And comment has a type comment, of course. That's very important. Um, because that is how GraphQL works at its core, that you access, uh, you access a collection of objects. You access a, sort of a graph of objects, all right? Um, and it's very important because the query here also has a type. This query here returns a list of posts. And that's how GraphQL can do the auto-completion here. You know, if I do that, it show me all the type, all the fields that exist for this specific type. Um, that's uh, how it works. GraphQL itself, your API, is a documentation. So you don't need a documentation. Uh, you don't need a doc, you know. Uh, you have everything you need in the graph. You can actually perform queries uh, on your, in GraphQL. So if I want to do, for example, this, I can ask for the this, for this schema. And I can ask for the types, the mutation that exists, and, and, and everything in my GraphQL. So your API is introspective. It is self-explanatory. You don't need a swagger. You don't need those fancy things. You don't need any of that. The API itself uh, uh, explain itself. So, there are a few interesting features. Uh, you remember um, I said that uh, I wanted to uh, display two set of posts. Well, here I only have one, uh, one key. Uh, it's a list of posts. Uh, it is because in GraphQL you can perform more than one query. You can perform any type, many queries. You can perform more, 10, 15 queries at the same time. Uh, so that if you want to aggregate queries, you can just do it in one batch. So, um, Let's try it. So, for example, I can do some. I can, I want to, I'm going to do something. It's called alias. You can rename uh, the name of your responses. So, for example, if I wanted the author to be named writer, I can just do that. And if I run my query, uh, now nah, uh, author is named writer. 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 All right. Um, so I can do that on uh, my query too. So I'm going to change something here. All right. So I just open a new bracket here, and um, well, I basically want those fields. Here, I want the ID, the title, the picture URL, and the writer with its name, right? So let's just do this, and let's run my query. Here it is, I have two sets of, of data. And I can do that as many times as I want. Let's say I want, for example, I also want a specific post, if I want a post by ID. Let's say I want the post um, with the ID three, for example, and I only want, I don't know, the, the ID and the, the title, I can do that, you know, and so on. I can just batch and aggregate as many query, as much query, as many queries I want. Okay, so there is another interesting things here. We have a, a duplicate of information, and uh, as a good developer, I don't like to have duplicate. Right? Uh, do it once. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, there is something called fragments. 
I can uh, create a fragment, so I have a keyword named fragment, and I can say I want, I'm gonna call this fragment uh, best base fields, for example. Uh, there is another keyword, it's named on, and um, the last parameter here is uh, the name of the type I want my fragment to work uh, on. So I want a fragment on post. And in this fragment, well, I want those fields here. The exact same field. And what I can do here is I can say, well, this query has the best fields and this query too. So you can simplify, sim simplify your queries, you can simplify things. There are many other features uh, that I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, not gonna show. I don't wanna spoil things, I want you to discover. Uh, but you can do a condition, for example. I can say uh, you have something called skip, something called include. I can say, depending on a, a few uh, parameters, I wanna skip those fields or not. I want to include this field or not. Uh, there are many other things like that. Um, but that was basically, in a nutshell, how GraphQL works. You ask for what you, you receive, what you ask for. Um, so there is the other type. Uh, it's called mutation. So a mutation works exactly the same. I have a, a certain number of, um, of uh, uh, mutations that exist. I only have one mutation here. So the thing that I'm using uh, when I'm doing this, and you see that, it's out uh, space, and it just uh, show me all the fields for a specific query or a specific object, right? So in mutation, I only have one, uh, one mutation. So we just autocomplete my mutation right away. So this mutation, recommend post, um, it upvotes a post, basically. I call it recommend, uh, like on Medium. Um, takes one ID. So let's take the, this one, for example. Let's take this one. So we're gonna recommend the post number three, okay? That's all it takes. Uh, the recommend post, so it, it tells me that it returns uh, one post, right? So I, I, I guess it returns the post, it just updated. So we're gonna display the title of the post and we're gonna display the vote, the number of votes. If I run my query, it's uh, incrementing, all right? I'm, I'm actually updating something on my server right at the moment. So um, that's for the imitation. There is a third type Scope subscription, but I won't talk about it uh, today because it would be too much information. And plus, the subscription type is still in draft; it's still being, uh, it's still in the in the um, in the making. But subscription basically is for real-time application. It works like a query; it's just a, a query that it's supposed to live uh, for as long as the connection is open. So you can do that over WebSocket or any uh, real-time transport. But we won't dive into it today. Uh, so. Um, that was um, basically how you ask information and how you perform operation uh, over GraphQL. All right, so what lies under the hood? Uh, that's the question. As I told you, GraphQL is a strongly typed language. Everything is a type. Uh, with, it's not, you don't have the concept of resource, you have the concept of types. So if you remember, we had a type named post. What you see here, uh, is called the uh, graph schema language. It's just a language that we use to um, define on the server the type that exists. Um, so on the server, there is somewhere, somebody wrote this code. Somebody say, there is a type named post with those fields. And those fields have types, right? String uh, or user. So you might notice the uh, exclamation mark. It's because GraphQL handles optional and nullability. So that here I'm saying, well, if you hit the post and if you receive a post, the title will never be null. But the content or the picture, they might be null one day. So you might want to take that into account when you receive the information. So that's, that's actually a, uh, that's a, um, an information for the, uh, the developer using the API. Uh, the author uh, has a type user. Uh, the uh, type user is a type that we created, right? Uh, with a few fields too. If you remember, we also had comments, right? As you can guess, the comments have a type comment. Um, and it's a list of comments. So this is how you specify a type, uh, a list. You, uh, uh, like an array, actually, an array of comments. So here we have um, a list that cannot be null of comments. So it means that when you're gonna receive the comments, if there is no comments, the array would just be empty. And inside of this array, the comments will never be null. 
So we have sort of a dependency here, right? We have uh, the post, we have uh, a dependency to uh, comment and author, and we had uh, the uh, comments for a dependency to author. So I don't know if you see what I'm, what I'm trying to get here, but this kind of looks like a graph. And it is because that's where GraphQL takes its name. It's because you don't access resource, uh, you, do, you access a graph of types. You access many types with, which have dependencies uh, to each other. So all of those types, this, you just take this huge thing here, they're a part of something even bigger. And this thing is called the schema. And the schema is the root and the mother of everything. If you remember, I told you that there are two types of queries, the mutation and the query. Well, the query and the mutation are both part of the schema, okay? And so now I want you to follow, because the query and the mutation, they both are type of GraphQL. So you don't access a graph of object. You access a query or a mutation that gives you access to your graph. So as every type, the query and mutation type, they have fields, right? And I, you can guess that those fields correspond to the name of your queries. So I have one field here, um, name post, another one, a name post with an S with a few parameters, uh, and I have another, another field uh, named upvote post, okay? So those two types um, are part of the schema. That's how you define uh, the schema. The root of everything in GraphQL is I say, here is my schema, and here is my queries, and here are the mutation. And in the mutation, I have this field and these fields. And all of those fields, well, they return you uh, a type, a GraphQL type. That's how it works. You never access a type directly. You just never say, uh, I want the author type, I want the comment type. You say, I want, to, I want the post field on the query type, all right? And then GraphQL will resolve it. So I'm gonna show you the code. And let's, let's see how it works. So I ask you because uh, about um, if you've done Node.js because <clears throat> it is basically um, my server is in Node.js. So I won't do pure live code here because there is a lot to take in. Um, so I'm going to show you bit by bit how it works, right? So here we have a uh, very simple Node.js server. We have a server.js file, okay? Uh, and uh, we have a db.js, and db.js is basically our database. You know, it's a fake database. We just have all the comments here, uh, and um, we have uh, the fake posts, and we have the, uh, the fake authors and everything, okay? And we have, a, so that's a fake database. It could be a Mongo, it could be a PostgreSQL, it could be any database you know, okay? So here is just a plain JS file with objects in it. So how does it work? Well. Here I have a few uh, boilerplate um, that I'm gonna explain. Um, but basically, I'm using Express. Uh, for those who don't know Express, in a nutshell, it's a library uh, that helps you uh, build um, web, web um, that helps you build uh, apps over HTTP, basically. That helps you serve information over HTTP, in a nutshell, once again. Um, and I have a certain number of libraries here. Where they all have uh, the GraphQL name. And uh, I have my database, all right? My database fake library. So first thing first, there are types, right? So we need to write our type, right? So um, all right. I know that it can be, OK. So we have a type post, for example, with a type, with a a few fields, right? We have a field ID of type string, uh, of type int, sorry, depending on your database, but let's say it's a, it's a MySQL database with a int auto-incremented uh, incremented IDs. Uh, we have um, a title field, type string, all right? And we have, uh, let's say, a content field of type string, okay? So let's say we only have one type in our, in our graph. The other part that's very important is you have, when you code GraphQL, you have two things. You have your type 
and you have the resolvers. And the resolver is the code you're going to write to say, I want to resolve this field, right? So if you remember, at the root of everything, there is the schema. And the schema has a query type. And in my query type, I have, let's say, one, only one, uh, one field. It's called post. And you just retrieve one post. Uh, it takes uh, one parameter named ID. And um, it, re it returns me one post, OK? So here, that's where things will, will start to get interesting. I need to write objects that correct, who corresponds to um, the, the type that, that, that exists in, graph Q, in, my, um, in my type definition, right? So here I have uh, an object named query. And I have one field named post. And this field is a function with uh, a few arguments here, args, all right? In this function, I'm going to return my objects. So here I'm going to return an empty array. So I'm just going to run the right server. All right, so that's a GraphQL error. It's telling me that there is a, an error in uh, the syntax, the syntax of my uh, my type. So here it is. There is a comma here. So normally it should work. All right, it's running. So if I run, if I go there, and if I do that, all right. If I do this posts and I specify one ID, and I say when the ID field, and I run it, I have an empty array. It's not, ah, it's my, yeah, yeah, there is nothing. You can't find anything. All right. So that's because I should return an object. That's my fault. Let's say I return an object here with an ID three and uh, a title. Let's say good job and uh, a content. No content. So if I run my query, I should get this object. All right, perfect. All right, awesome. So what I want to do now is that I actually want to, to get an object in my database, right? So I'm going to create a, uh, just a const here, a variable. I'm going to call, call it posts, OK? And um, want to, so in the database are a few, a few methods. Um, and there, there are actually three collections. There is the comments, the post, and the user comment collection. And um, on the post collection, there are a few methods. And there is one called find by ID here. And it takes an ID. The ID, as you can guess, is in the args, right? Um, there are a few specificities here. But the first parameter in the library I'm using. The first parameter is called the context. It's because you can pass information, uh, like uh, the authentication keys or some things like that, or the current users. And those information are like here, right? And we're not going to use this. Uh, the actual arguments are here in another object, in the second parameter, named args. And in args, I have uh, something named ID. I should have something named ID. And so here, I'm just going to return the post I found, all right? Here it is. Boom, that's what I get. I get my, uh, the post in the database. All right, so that's in a nutshell how you write a GraphQL API from the ground. Uh, you specify type definitions, you specify resolvers, and uh, you just resolve the field. Uh, I'm just going to do one last thing here. Um, if you remember, a post has an author, right, of type author. So let's create the type author. OK, so the author just has a name, all right, of type string. So I want to display, sorry, I want to display uh, the author, OK? If I do that, if I do this, it doesn't work. Because the author doesn't exist. And you know why? Because in the database, if I go on a specific post, 
the author is actually an ID. Pretty logical. It's a database. I don't have a nested object, right? So I want to find this specific author. Well, I have to create another object that has the name of the type that corresponds to it. So here it's post. And, and here it's interesting because, as I told you, every field, every single field is a function, right, in GraphQL. ID, title, content. In GraphQL, for GraphQL, those are functions. They're just functions without parameters. So since the ID, title, and content field, they exist on the object that the database return, GraphQL is able to return it. it just, it's very simple. It finds fields that have the same name as something that exists in the, in the, uh, the, the type definition. It just matches them and just return them. But here, the author doesn't exist. You can't find an author, right? So we need to resolve the author. So here, we need to actually write a function named author. And in this function, we're going to return the, uh, the author that, that we need, right? So ah, thank you. So for the, um, the um, post type, uh, for the query type, is, there, is, there, is, there are differences here. So here, the first two parameters, uh, here you have the content, and here you have the argument. For the author type, you only have one argument. And this argument is actually the post that, this, that the uh, database returned. It's uh, just the JSON that we have, the, the, the pure JSON that we have. And we're just going to um, go to the, in this JSON, and we're going to take uh, the um, author, right? How, how is it, it named? It's called author ID. So, here we're just going to return the, the corresponding author. So we're just going to go in the uh, database, and uh, we're going to find the user, and we're going to find it by ID, right? I'm just going to pass it the author ID. The author ID is on my post object. It's here, post author ID. Oh, sorry. You must have a selection of subfields, of course, and you only have a name. There it is. Let's remove this awful thing. Oh. Here it is, Todd Rally. I don't know who that is. But yeah. Um, all right. So that's how you do. You have, um, you have uh, your, your query types. You have basically just have types with fields. And GraphQL, what it does is that it goes to the query type, looks for the field you asked for, go into this field, resolve this field. So it calls this function first. Then it, it gets the object. And then it tries to resolve every field that there exists in this, in this JSON, right? So, ID exists, all right, title, content, author. Well, it's an ID. What should I do? Well, it goes through your graph and goes to the post type and find the resolver for the author and just resolve the author at the same time. So do, doing that, you can do very powerful things, very easy things. You can have multiple databases, different places, and you can have, uh, for example, uh, you can, you, we could have uh, the post in the Mon in Mongo database. We could have the user in the MySQL database. And it doesn't really matter uh, to your client. It doesn't really matter to you either. You, know, you just call the right function and just resolve the right object. Right? Um, so that's basically how, uh, how it works. Um, so to go from here, uh, we just scratched the surface of GraphQL in general, like really, there, there are many things uh, I didn't talk about uh, in this talk, really. There, there are very amazing stuff uh, going on under the hood, very, very convenient functions, very convenient uh, um, operations and, and other things. Oh, sorry. Uh, from here, what you guys can do is go to the graphql.org website. Uh, it's a website uh, made by Facebook. Uh, and it's basically the uh, specification, it's the, the um, the standard website uh, for everything GraphQL. Uh, and you can just go there and read the documentation. It's very, very, very straightforward. Uh, it's by chapter. And uh, you, in like three hours, you, you understand everything. It's very well, well done. So that's the only resource I'm going to give you guys, because that's the only that one that matters at the moment. It's the GraphQL.org website. Um, so um, well, thank you. Uh, for listening. I know it's very, it's not that easy. There are, there's a lot to take in, um, but it's a very interesting technology. Uh, once again, REST is aging. Uh, people say, yeah, it's uh, the end of REST or GraphQL will replace REST and things like that. I, I'm not really into this kind of debate. It's not interesting. What is, is interesting is that for 20 years, we've been using the same standard. We've been using the same set of ideas, really important. Um, 
And uh, at the time, 20 years ago, when the, graph, when the REST, specific, when the REST uh, came out, there were no mobile phones, there were no VR, no AR, um, none of, no smartwatches, no connected device as we know them today, you know? And so all those new technologies and all the technologies that will come, they will all bring new complexities, you know, in building APIs, building apps, and, you know, serving information over the network. And REST is just not fit for that. Uh, at the moment, it's not fit for that anymore. And it's okay, you know, that's how things work, how, that's how things goes, you know. And GraphQL came in, and maybe something else will come, you know. Uh, GraphQL is still pretty young, but it's supported by, by Facebook, and a lot of companies are using that. Um, GitHub has released a GraphQL API, uh, and many other companies are doing it uh, at the moment. So it is a real contender, and uh, I, what I, what, my, my goal here uh, is just if you guys want to build an API, go and try GraphQL. It's really easy to get, to get into. Uh, and if you want to try it at your, at your company, well, just use a certain arguments. You know, you just say, well, we will, it will save us money. Less data, less, uh, less, you know, less money used. You, know, it's, you can just use it on very small part on, uh, on your project. Uh, that's what I did for my first project. We only use GraphQL on, we replace one root uh, with GraphQL, and we divide it by 10, 15 the, the, the request time um, uh, on the project. So um, thank you guys once again uh, for coming and uh, listening. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoy the talk. Thank you. We can uh, go to the question. Hi. Hi. Uh, just want to, is there any alternative or is it going to be the, the new standard, uh, the, the replacement for the RESTful API? So, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, or you can say in French if you want. <laughs> est-ce qu'il y a d'autres alternatives? Ou est-ce que c'est la seule solution apportée pour remplacer l'API REST? So, it's okay if I answer in English? Yeah. So, as of today, um, I think it's the only real um, modern um, uh, solution. You know, and by modern, I say something that covers most of the use case that you can have when you're building an API today. Uh, there are many other things that exist. So when I said REST is not uh, a specification, it's because it's not. REST is a set of ideas. And um, I, I'm not, I, I don't know, but if you had these like, arguments in companies, oh, it's not RESTful, it's not RESTful, and things like that, you know. I've heard a lot of that. It's because you have a lot of freedom, actually, with REST. And you have a few uh, real standards that exist. You have JSON API and other things who are standard. There are REST standards that who exist and who specify you know, things concretely, like how you should implement things concretely. So alongside those things that exist, um, I don't see anything else. You, know, you have uh, SOAP, RPC, and all those, like, all those standards that exist. You know, but the only modern one that provides a, an interesting solution to the problem we can have, I don't see any now uh, aside from GraphQL. Plus, it's it's from a very young company too, uh, um, Facebook. Uh, so let's say that mo I, I think it would take time, you know, like in new companies to see new standards come uh, on the on the market. Yeah. Uh, I did not understand the, uh, the the schema. The schema yeah. when you, you do a query on the on, on an element, for example, uh, the, the schema is updated in real time. When you do a query on the, you mean when you do a query on something, the schema is, a, no, the schema is not updated. The schema is something that is fixed. Everything is fixed. So the schema is a description. Actually, it's a description that contains everything you need to know about your GraphQL API. Uh, and in the schema, you have the query, the mutation, and in the mutation and in the query, you have the fields, uh, you have the, your, um, the, the, um, the operations, the post, the get, and the, the, the post by ID, the, post list, uh, you know, the uh, comments by ID, and all those methods that you can get. But the, the schema is like something that is, it's out in the outside, it, it contains everything. It contains your whole thing. Your GraphQL, Graph, your GraphQL API is actually a schema, just a huge, big schema. Companies like Facebook have huge schema. They're, they're maintaining just a huge string, basically. At the end of the day, it, that's, that's how, that's what it is, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, as part of the documentation of your API, you are only providing the schema? That's it. OK. That's it. And uh, I didn't show you, but 
actually, if you want to, to, to um, add information, you just ha add comment commentary. So here I say, uh, give uh, returns one post uh, uh, depending on its ID, right? So, and this, uh, you will have access to that, you know, uh, here. Uh, if I go there, I have this information, returns one post depending on its ID. Everything is in the type and in the schema. You put everything in, you know, all your comments and everything. Uh, uh, the schema basically contains the whole thing. If uh, yeah. you have a mature uh, REST API. Sorry, uh, I didn't yeah. hear. If you have a very mature REST API that, uh, let's say, it uh, already incorporates solutions to most of the GraphQL address problems like uh, underfetching, overfetching, you implemented your own custom solution for them, would you, would you, what would you choose between keep evolving an existing very mature REST API or replacing it with GraphQL if you already have solved the Can solutions? Can you mic like this because I'm not ah, sure? Yeah. sorry. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, uh, would you keep evolving a uh, mature REST API that already has solutions for problems like overfetching and underfetching? So, you have implemented an API that has a solution already? Yeah, let's say. Uh, actually, no, let's say. Uh, yeah. I already have a big uh, REST API mature that already has some custom solutions to both overfetching and yeah. underfetching. Yeah, that's interesting because would those you are keep Yeah, sorry, you want to? Would so, you? Yeah, yeah, continue. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right, all right. So that's a, that's an interesting, the, the interesting thing, and I think actually that's one of the problem. Uh, it's that uh, actually there are solutions to, uh, for example, asking for information that you need. It's called sparse field sets. It exists. Um, Facebook was doing that. YouTube, or LinkedIn are doing that. So you just say specify the field that you want, and most of the time it's limited yeah. to a few uh, a few uh, objects. So you're just gonna say, oh, uh, I don't want the comments, nor uh, I don't want the uh, collaborators, I don't want those lists, but you're gonna receive the other fields anyway. Um, it just helps you re reduce uh, the size of the glo your global, re global response. The thing is, and it's very interesting what you say, is that it's a custom solution. So the uh, uh, YouTube API, LinkedIn API, or, um, or a, a Facebook API, to do that, they don't look the same at all. It's not the same schema. It's because it does, it, it's not the same way of thinking. It's because it doesn't exist in REST. REST doesn't specify that. And that's something I, I, I really wanted uh, to, to um, I really wanted us, I, I really wanted you guys to, uh, to think about it, is that REST is so impregnated REST so much that we forget that it's not a standard. It's a set of ideas. And you have, you have freedom to do custom things on top of this, this idea to solve your problems. Uh, GraphQL comes with all those, those problems impacted into one solution, one standard. And it's not just a library. Right? GraphQL is not a library. If you go on the website or uh, you go read the white paper, the white paper is just explanation about how GraphQL is built, how you can implement GraphQL in your own language. Let's say you create a language called the Scrubs or you create, you create any language. You can do that in your language. And actually, most languages we know today, they have already have an implementation in GraphQL. Um, so GraphQL states, let's say that the scope of GraphQL is larger than the, 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 the scope of, of, uh, of REST. Now, the thing is, if you're building an API um, and you already have a, a solution to those problems, don't try to like, you know, move to, like jump onto a train because it's trendy or something like that. If you actually have the problem, well, do that. You know, okay. So the, the advantage is standardization mainly. Sorry? The main advantage is standardization that everybody the main agrees is standardization, on the solution. Yeah, it's a standard. It's a full, full on standard. And it's very hard, re really hard to diverge uh, from that. Thank you. Yeah. Also something very interesting is that uh, if you're doing, if you have different um, transport, like if most of apps today are real time, you have WebSocket and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you, have, you, do, you do other stuff on HTTP, there is no way, uh, like there is no standard way to communicate in WebSocket today. You know, you can actually send queries on GraphQL in your WebSocket. It, it's, it's just a string. It's very, it's really just that. It's just a big string. You know, you just send your string, and your server is just going to process it and return you a, a GraphQL answer over the network, over the WebSocket. Uh, have you got any examples where you would? If there was a project, you would say, I'm not going to use GraphQL for this, 
REST is more like it's a better solution? So that's the interesting question. The thing is, I think everything you can do with REST, you can do it with GraphQL. I don't think there are projects that are suited for any of you know, those. We just had a very like, young time where it, it's an early time. So there aren't many GraphQL API out there. So it's the big, like people start asking this question like, should I do GraphQL or REST on this project? I think if you want to try, and it's a very stable technology, do everything with GraphQL. You know, it's, it's going to work, uh, and you, you won't bump into a limitation. You know? the, it's not all green. There are a few problems with GraphQL. Uh, I didn't address in the thing, but it's not, it's not all, all green. But um, you can start with just one part of your project. So uh, I said earlier that I was, uh, I was working in a startup, and we had a problem. So we, we were... Uh, we were basically, what you, do, what you did is that you, you will arrive on the map. On the map, very classic, you had a, a few uh, markers with places. And when you click on the marker, you have the menu of the place. Basic stuff. The thing is, we had a crazy hierarchy of objects. Because we have a menu, and we have categories, and subcategories, and we had, uh, ob we had uh, meals. And all the meals, they had options. And the options had options. And the requirement was simple. We wanted to show everything. There were no way to, uh, to do, like, to fetch things later. We wanted everything in one place. That's why I started doing GraphQL, actually, because it was loading and loading for so long, and I, I just tried to, tried to find a solution. So I bumped into sparse field set, which is a, a solution that exists uh, if you want to do it in REST. But it's just so long to implement, you know? I just, I, and I bumped into GraphQL, and I just tried it. I had uh, some freedom, so I, I just tried it. I implemented it, and it took. 20, I think it sped up, sped up things by, by a factor of 20, even 30 times, you know. It, it, a, it, there were no loaders anymore, it was instant. We had, a, we had a menu, you know. So that was a very good use case. Uh, and also we had, the menus were in a, a Mongo database, the places were in the MySQL database, and some part of the menu were in the MySQL database for some reasons, you know. So anyway, we had uh, these like crazy things and we, had, we, we could aggregate all of it just into GraphQL. So that's a good example. But I think if you're building a brand new app uh, and you're building an API for your app, go GraphQL, try it. it. You have nothing to lose, actually. You can even, once you, what, you can, what you can do, you can wrap your REST API into GraphQL. It's, it's very simple. You just call, instead of like calling the, uh, a function for a database on your resolver, you just do a, a HTTP request. That's simple. You, you, can, you can proxy your API with a, with a with, uh, with, uh, with GraphQL. I think that's what most companies do. I think that's what GitHub does. They're just practicing their REST API. And over time, if you feel like it's something you want to keep going, you want to keep working on this, you just bit, bit by bit remove all the queries you're doing in behind, you know, all the uh, REST queries you're doing in behind. It, it's actually very easy to migrate from GraphQL to REST, from REST to GraphQL. You just wrap it. Just wrap, just wrap it. That's a good uh, catchphrase. Just wrap it. Uh, as there is only one endpoint, do you have tools to monitor uh, what are the calls and the, if you want to monitor what data is fetched, where it, if it is post or gets uh, calls, how do you proceed? Do you have tools to monitor uh, what is uh, the cost? Of, of the cost? Yes. The cost of what? I understand that uh, you have only one endpoint. So if you want to uh, monitor what kind of, what are the most calls made to your API? Okay, yeah. So that's the thing, is that uh, the HTTP verbs, they don't exist in GraphQL. For GraphQL, they don't exist. So it might sound crazy for most of you, but actually all the queries I did, the query type, when you query something, you, you, use, a, you use a post. Uh, it's a post verb. Actually, I think most implementation of GraphQL only do post. There is no delete, there is no, uh, it doesn't exist for GraphQL. Well, the only thing that matters, everything you need to know is in this single string. And the HTTP or any other verb that you're using or any other things like that doesn't matter. So you, you, you can't really monitor that because it's noise. It's not important information for a GraphQL API. I don't want to know if I'm doing a GET request or a POST request because it doesn't matter. All I'm doing is I'm just giving you a string. 
you know? It's like when we're talking, you know? I'm just talking to you, I'm not in a delete mode, and in a post mode, and in a patch mode, in a put mode, and so on, you know? I'm just telling you guys things, you know, and, you, and you're returning me information. That's how it works. Just say, hey, buddy, give me that. And it gives you that, and that's it, you know? Post, delete, patch, they don't exist. They don't, they don't, they don't matter. Thank you, Glenn, for this presentation.